from Mike's house to you, direct. <laughs> this is very strange. <laughs> Um, welcome uh, to Remote Computer File. Um, what are we looking at today? All right, well, Steve did a great video on VPNs and how to work remotely, right? And now we're all doing this. So I thought I'd talk also a little bit about networking or, you know, a cryptographic protocol um, that we often use over networks. In one of my previous videos, I talked about quantum computing and, and what kind of effect, if any, that would have on encryption. And the answer really is that it has quite a big effect on public key cryptography, but not that big an effect on, on symmetric cryptography. You know, that's assuming we can build bigger quantum computers sometime. Now, what I wanted to talk about today is a really cool protocol that actually sees a lot of use, particularly, I mean, everywhere, right, on lots of different operating systems, but particularly on Active Directory as its main authentication mechanism, and that's Kerberos, right? You remember Kerberos, the three-headed dog? The guards, I think Hades, is it? So it has a cool name, we're off to a good start. Kerberos is a really interesting protocol because it's a way of managing authentication and communication over a network like a giant enterprise level network. But it does it without really requiring any kind of public key at all. Uh, so it does it all with symmetric encryption. So it is inherently very robust to any kind of quantum computer. So Kerberos was invented um, in the 70s at MIT, um, and it's still maintained by MIT, but obviously in, in recent years, you know, variants of it have appeared in things like Windows Active Directory. I'm just gonna talk sort of in general about Kerberos. I'll try and draw attention to the differences between, you know, the Active Directory version, but mostly it's naming differences really is, is what we're concerned with. One of the issues, if we're going to use um, only symmetric encryption, is we have to work out how to share keys. Right. We can't do key exchange because that's public key. We can't verify people using something like certificates because that's RSA, that's public key. So what do we do? Well, one of the ways we can share keys is using passwords. Right. So we could derive a key. Like I could take my password, I could hash it in some known way, and then we could, you could do the same thing if you were a server but knew my password or knew the hash, and we could have a shared secret that way. So. Okay, let's say we want to do this, right? Well, now let's think about the number of machines on a standard corporate network, right? Maybe there's 2,000 laptops on any given day connected to the network and 10,000 desktops and 200 servers. How many of these passwords are we using? Are they all shared? Are you got different passwords, different keys? I mean, let's use a very simple example. Let's imagine we have a network with 10 machines. So I'm just going to draw 10 machines. I, I should have drawn fewer machines. Let's, you know what? I can undo this. I can say five machines. Now, if I want to have a shared key that's, let's say, different for security reasons between all of these machines, it's going to look something like, I, th I think that's all of them, right? And then if I add another machine, a sixth machine here, I've got to do this, and a seventh machine. This is an absolute mess, right? Because we can't do key exchange. So normally what you would do on the internet is you would just talk to a machine, do a quick key exchange, and then you've got yourself um, a session key for the rest of that conversation. We can't do that because that's a public key protocol which is vulnerable to things like quantum, right? And also actually at the time, I don't think Diffie-Hellman existed when this was first developed, right? Or at least the, the protocols underpinning this. So we're not gonna use public key as a solution. We're gonna come up with something different. What we're gonna try and do is use the fact that we have this server, which I'm gonna draw sort of nice and big here, server, right? Or a big S on it, like for Superman. This server, we all trust. And because we all trust that server, we can use that to give us temporary keys. So in orange, I'm going to draw, let's imagine that these machines now have long-term keys with this server, right? So there's now one, two, three, four, five, seven keys. There's seven permanent keys, probably based off passwords, right, with this server. We all trust the server for now, so that's good. Now let's imagine that this machine wants to talk to this machine. What we do is we ask the server to send us a key that we can use for that conversation and it just generates one at random and protects it using these encrypted channels. And then we can temporarily use this green key for our session. So the key exchange is now using this trusted third party. So this is kind of what Kerberos is about. It has the benefit that it doesn't rely on public key, but also there's an inherently, there's a really elegant way that it authenticates you because basically you can't talk between these two machines unless this has given you a key to do it, which is in some sense giving you permission to do it. If this is a file server and you want to access a file server, it's only going to work if you've got a key from here. And if it doesn't give you one because you're not allowed, good luck getting onto the file server, right? That's the idea. So it's quite a neat trick, but, but gets around just using symmetric 
and has this authentication built in. Now Kerbos is obviously a little bit more complicated than this, so that's what we're gonna delve into now. We're gonna be on a fictitious network now, and this is me over here. Now you know, as you know from my previous videos, I'm very good at drawing computers and they always look realistic. So this is my little desktop. So this is me, I'm gonna be A, A for Alice or, you know. And here we have our authentication and our ticket granting servers. Now these are part of Kerbos. We're gonna have a big machine over here, and this is gonna have two servers in it, or two services. Now in the original Kerberos, this would be called a key distribution center, or KDC. Often this role is performed by something called a domain controller on Active Directory. Now in here, we have two kinds of servers. We have our authentication server, which I'm gonna call S, and our ticket granting server, which I'm gonna call T. And everything to do with authentication and connecting to like an Active Directory or any other kind of Kerberos setup is going to be using these two services. So the authentication server is going to be responsible for checking your password essentially and making sure you actually do have an account on that directory or that network. And the ticket granting server is going to be responsible for issuing you tickets which you can use to go and access things like file servers or printers or whatever else it is on the network. The first thing to do is to approach the authentication server, assuming we've already had an account created, and send them a message. So we're gonna send them a message which says, my name is A, I would like to talk to the ticket granting server, and here is a random number that I'm going to use to prevent replay attacks. All right. but we're not gonna worry too much about them, we're just gonna pass them back and forth. But the point is, I'm sending a message, not really necessarily encrypted, to this authentication server, but I'm A, and I'd like to talk to a ticket granting server. Now, the important thing here is, assuming that A has an account, it has an established key between A and S. I have a key, AS, which I can use to talk to that server for the long term, because it's based on my password. Maybe I only change my password every 12 months or whatever, right? Um, my password's very good, I don't have to change it. I should, I, should, I should know this. Now, so I'm gonna send this message across to S. Now, S is gonna reply. S is going to send a message which is encrypted. Assuming it allows me to talk to T, it's gonna send me some messages that mean I can then talk to T, right? So the first one is gonna be, here's a key, K-A-T, that you can use to talk between these two. Here's your nonce back again to prevent replay attacks. This is the current time. This is the lifetime of this ticket, and you're okay to talk to the ticket granting server. So it just has a lot of different parts to this message. The things to bear in mind are, so the time stamp and the lifetime are so that you can't like hold on to a ticket for sort of two years and play it again, right? And you know, we have the names of things in there to make sure everyone knows who it is they're supposed to be talking to. So the important thing in this message is this key, K-A-T. Right? I'm using A-T to symbolize this as a session key between A and T. Right? Now I don't have a long-term key with T, my computer doesn't have that. This is generated on the fly by this server. Now this is encrypted, this message, because we can't be sending keys over the internet if it are not encrypted. So this is gonna be encrypted with my very well-drawn curly brackets, and this is gonna be encrypted using KAS, which is of course our long-term key between A and the authentication server. What I can do now is I can decrypt this message using KAS, because that's derived off my password, and I can read this session key, and then I can use it to talk to T. The problem is that T doesn't have this session key, right? this is new, this is brand new, this key. So it's gonna send, S is gonna send me some more information. Right? It's gonna send me the same KAT, it's gonna say this is to talk to A, and this is the lifetime of that ticket, and this is going to be encrypted with KST. So the, the authentication server S is going to use a long-term key ST to encrypt this message, which I can't read, right? Because I don't have ST, I'm, I'm A, right? So this is a ticket that I can pass to T for it to use, and only it can understand. So this is called a wonderfully named ticket granting ticket. It's a ticket that's gonna let me get more tickets in the future. Right? So I take this first message, I decrypt it, and I have the session key that I need. I forward this message on to the ticket granting server, it decrypts it, and assuming it's okay, it, it now has the message that it needs. That's kind of cool. Um, this is all, the, the other really nice thing about this is that it's fire and forget. So this authentication server can very quickly look me up in the database, fire back these two new session keys encrypted, and then it's done, its work is done, right? It's authenticated me, that's the end of the discussion. Right? It doesn't need to talk to me anymore until I log on another time. So the next thing I have to do, I want to talk to some kind of server, file server, let's say, called B. 
Um, now, we can't do that yet because we haven't got a ticket. And in that ticket is going to be a new session key that we can use to encrypt that conversation. So I'm going to send a message. I'm going to use my purple again. I kind of, I've kind of messed up the colors. We'll do our best. <laughs> right. Um, so I'm going to send a message now to T and that's going to be, first of all, this ticket. Right? That ticket says I'm A and this is my new session key that we can use. And this has kind of been stamped, as it were. It's been authenticated by the fact that it's encrypted by KST, which is the authentication server's private key with this T here. So I'm going to send my name is A. This is a timestamp to make sure everything is taking place at the right time. I'd like to talk to B, please. And this is some new random number that we're going to use to prevent replay attacks. And this is all going to be encrypted using the KAT session key we've just obtained. So KAT. So only me and T can read that. Right. I have to take this and I also forward on the ticket. It decrypts the ticket and now it has access to KAT and can read my message. Right. And no one else can. This is why Kerbos is so clever. And so this ticket granting server is going to look at me and it's going to look at my account and it's going to look at what B is and work out whether it is OK that I actually talk to B. Right. Now, assuming that's the case, it's going to respond, right? It's going to send me back. Let's, uh, let's go with green for this one. Well, I don't know. It's going to do exactly the same as the authentication server is. So it's going to produce me a new random key to be used to talk to B, right? Which we're going to call KAB. So we're not, don't get super confused. All right, so KAB. And we're going to reply with the random number as well to prevent replay attacks. This is the timestamp of the server. This is the lifetime of this ticket. And finally, I would like you to talk to B and of course, this is going to be encrypted using our key between A and T, right? K-A-T. That makes sense. Everyone's in messages are encrypted with their own session key or their own long-term key, depending on which one you're talking to. Right? Um, and of course, what else does it need to send? Well, we need B to be able to have this K-A-B in order to have a conversation. So it's going to have to send another ticket to let us access B. So this is going to have K-A-B. Right, so that's our shared secret. This is, I would like you to talk to A. This is the lifetime. This is going to be encrypted with a key that only T and B have, right? which is KBT. Right. So that will be some password or other, other sort of um, long-term key between this file server B and our ticket granting server, or our key distribution center. Now we need to talk to B. Right, so I'm going to, uh, oh, I don't know, let's, let's, uh, let's draw B over here. So this is our file server B. This is B. That, that's a rack server. It's the worst rack server I've ever seen. B is just sitting on the network waiting for thing, people to talk to it, right? Um, <laughs> and um, I come along, it gets very excited. I'm going to forward on the ticket, right? Because that's the one that it can decrypt. It uses its long-term key, BT, to decrypt this. And now it has access to this session key. It also, in some sense, has a proof that I'm allowed to talk to B because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to produce this ticket because this was encrypted by the ticket granting server. A bit like how a digital signature on the internet might provide some sort of proof of authenticity, this kind of has that role. Right? I wouldn't have been able to produce this ticket if the ticket granting server hadn't encrypted it for me to pass on. So I pass on a ticket and I also pass on a message that says very simply, my name is A, this is the current time, and I'm going to encrypt this using K, a, B, which is the new key I just got given by a ticket granting server. So I send it that. I also send it the ticket. It decrypts the ticket, looks at KAB, and it can now understand this message. And finally, it responds with my timestamp plus one as a challenge to prove that it can actually understand the message and it's not an imposter. And that's going to be also encrypted with KAB. So I've used the ticket from a ticket granting server to talk to B. And now I can then continue using that ticket for a while and continue encryption with B, right? And then we can start to send files back and forth and things like that. So let's sort of look one more time at what, what's gone on here, right? I wanted to talk to B and I also wanted to authenticate to this network, right? Because this network is, let's say, my university network and I wanted to log in. And all I have at the moment is a password. So what I do is I send a message to the authentication server that says, I'm A and I'd like to talk to the ticket granting server. It sends me back an encrypted message that I would not be able to read if I didn't have my password. So that's how it authenticates me. And it also crucially sends me a ticket that I can use to pass on to the ticket granting server. These two things both contain a new session key that I can use for encryption. So then I talk to the ticket granting server 
and the exact same process happens again. I say, I'm A, I'd like to talk to B. Uh, B is a file server. The ticket granting server will look at this, it will look at what B is and decide, okay, he is allowed to access this server. So it will send me back a message with a new key and it will also send me back a ticket to pass on to B. So it's the exact same process. So every time I want to talk to anything on this network, I can just go to the ticket granting server with my ticket and say, please may I have another one for this? And it will give me new tickets. So I can just go and get tickets. It's like, like at a fairground and you know, you've got like a Ferris wheel and other stuff and you just go to one desk to buy all the tickets and then you can go to the actual rides later or something like that. It's that kind of idea. So I then can talk to B and we have this little exchange that makes sure that you know, there's no replay attacks and you know, we're not doing anything untoward. So it's a really neat way of just using symmetric encryption to gain actually some pretty good security. With these tickets, how long, do they, how long does a ticket last? Oh, so it depends on the ticket. But on an authentication ticket, like the one you get, sort of a ticket granting ticket, right, from, from, from S, that could last 24 hours or something like that. Now, to tell it where it's going, where it's come from. And then these days, the local network will almost certainly...